Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, today, uh, we're going to do a quiz. We're going to do a wildlife quiz. And uh, I hope that uh, it's going to be 20 questions. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'll present, the, I'll present the, the question. It'll be true or false, and it'll be multiple choice. Um, we're not going to be able to do interactive. Hopefully, in a future one, we're going to have an interactive one where you guys can click, and then we'll tally the answers and stuff. But what we're going to do, I'm going to present the question. You, you, you guys can look at look at the uh, answers, think about it, and then I'll I'll, I'll wait about a minute and, and let maybe half a minute and I'll, I'll I'll put the answer on the thing and then I on the uh, screen and then I will have I'm going to do some little video outtakes of the animal so I may add upon the quiz question uh, about the animal and I hope that uh, I'm just going to share whatever I can um, about the animal that um, you know is interesting and. Um, uh, you know, using both the factual uh, biological information and then maybe some applied science stuff, a little bit about the, the animal's um, uh, status in Connecticut. Um, I always think of wildlife um, from a population standpoint. Is the population of that animal increasing, decreasing, stable? Um, is it endangered? You know, is it, is it, is it going to be, you know, is it threatened to, for extinction? You know, but, but, uh, being able to answer that question, you know, is it increasing, decreasing, or stable, is is really uh, a neat exercise to think about. When you, when I, whenever I think of an animal, um, you know, thinking of it, uh, is Connecticut's environment conducive to that population's being stable? Does it is the habitats in Connecticut um, conducive to it being uh, an increasing population, or or is it a pop, uh, the habitats of Connecticut? causing it to decline because the habitats are degraded or declining. So I, I like to think about it that way. And of course, the, the interesting facts about animals, just, you know, um, it's really neat to, to just think about wildlife um, and all the interesting facts. And of course, we're going to be just touching the tip of the iceberg, right? Because what are 20 questions? We have all these neat animals out there. Okay, true or false, uh, black bears have uh, they're young in January. Well, the answer is true. They uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but the the sows are um, uh, while the cold winter season is is upon us, they're they're giving birth in their den, and it's pretty amazing. It's actually when I when I learned that fact, I I thought it was pretty pretty impressive. And um, biologists here in Connecticut are studying the black bear really intensely over the last uh, 10 or 12 years or more. And why are they doing that? Well, they're, you know, they're trying to get a handle on this, uh, this very adaptable animal that's moved into a state that has 3 million people living here. And uh, a lot of people are, shy, are surprised that you know, uh, we have so many people and how can we have all these bears now? Well, they're very adaptable. And it took them a while to get back here after reforestation happened. I'd like to share with you a video uh, our biologists go out and they dart uh, sows in the winter. They'll they'll radio collar them. Um, they'll go to the dens uh, and um, and uh, assess the den, you know the, the the cubs, the conditions, and and they'll uh, re re uh, you know if there's a collared female, they'll, they'll they'll put a new collar on it and re you know make sure the air tags are good because they're they're studying their movements and their their habits. Um, I, I was lucky enough one day I went out with the bear crew and I was able to videotape Jason Hawley, one of our biologists, um, dart, actually dart a, a sow. Um, uh, the, you'll see in the video, I'll be videotaping, you'll see the bear going back and forth and then you'll see um, me actually um, show you where the cubs are and then the sow will come back and you'll, you'll see the video. It's pretty cool. I think you'll enjoy it. I'll try, I'll try to describe it as we go. Um, here we are in the forest. Um, there, um, it's a little blurry right now, but um, you know it's kind of a uh, you know hick, uh, a uh, hemlock forest, pine forest with deciduous you know there were hardwoods, but um, deciduous trees as well. But uh, you'll see there's the sow that took off um, from the den. She she took off and she left behind two two cubs. And um, the strategy that biologists use is um, the sow will only go a short distance away. 
and uh, the biologist will, there, there she is, and she's looking back at the den, and he'll position, he or she will position herself themselves to be able to dart, dart the uh, sow. Sometimes they're able to just um, use a jab stick and 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 not have to dart with a with a dart gun. But in this case, you're going to see, uh, you can see there's a sow with her ear tags, and now she she's going to be coming back to the den and. Um, Jason Holly positioned himself between the the um, the den and the and the uh, and the sow, and you'll see um, in a few minutes here, a few seconds. Well, you know, a few that less than probably a couple minutes here, a minute and a half. You'll see the um, it's really really intense because you picture me. I'm here videotaping while this is all happening, and you know, I'm not that far away. I'm maybe you know. 100 yards away, maybe 80 yards away, not even. And so you're really, uh, it's an intense moment. Now you're, you're gonna see there's Jason right here. Here he is kneeling down, fully camouflaged, and he's got his dart gun. And um, over here are the steer, right here are the Cubs. See the Cubs? Right here, uh, you can barely, well, let's see, on the left bottom right there, there, you can see the two cubs right there. See them? There they are, just hanging out right next to the den. I got to hold those later while they were processing the sow. It was really cool. Um, but here's, um, now watch, the, um, at some point, the sow is going to come, come, you know, she wants to get, go back to the den. So, you know, things settle down, and here she is. She's making her way back. Sometimes they they'll smell the air. They know that something somebody's around. They you know, they went back. Now you can see um, this is this is where the sow is right here. Here's the sow, and then she's going to make a decision to come down the down down the hill. You have to have a lot of patience when, when you're out there. You can't make any noise. Um, you know, if the wind is in the wrong direction, you know, she, she won't come down. So the wind has to be correct because she, she won't um, smell the, um, you know, the, the human. You know, there's this, there, the, there are the cubs. You'll see, um, Okay, there she is. Now she's coming down. And you'll see Jason. All right now, there's Jason. You see him with the dart gun, and he and he and he put a rump. The, the dart went into the rump of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, bear, and they went off and uh, you know it um, processed. Process the uh, the sow. They they take measurements. They they redo. They re uh, um, they take new put a new collar on. Make sure everything is uh, working well. And then they take measurements on the on the uh, the cubs. They they put pit tags in the in the cubs so that they can be recognized later on. And it's all part of the scientific collection. Okay, true or false? Resident Canada goose populations grow at a faster rate than migratory populations. True or false? In Connecticut, there's two populations. There's a resident and there's a migratory one. Which ones grow faster? The, the, the resident population uh, grows faster. Let's see. True. Um, yes. Um, one of the biggest challenges for Connecticut with, the, with geese is that the resident population 
grows at a greater rate than the migratory one. And a lot of people say, well, why is that? Well, anytime we make a pond or a lake and we plant lots of green grass around it and we keep it uh, mowed down and tundra-like, looking like the tundra, the geese will uh, adapt very well to that environment. And uh, so what happens is the, um, the migratory population that comes from, you know, up, way up north and goes down to Maryland, that population only grows about 5% a year because they're, you know, first of all, you have perils when you're flying, migra migrating, because you have to spend, spend energy and all the, the weather and things like that. But also they're hunted by hunters from north all the way to south. There's a, there's a, a pretty good demand for, their, for hunting of Canada geese. A lot of people will, a lot of hunters will lease farmers fields and hunting clubs will lease land to, to hunt the geese. And they're regulated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the individual states have um, you know, seasons and bag limits. Connecticut, because we have this resident goose population that's increasing, and by the way, um, we've all experienced the goose droppings on the fields, you know, the ball fields and things. Picture about a quart of um, feces a day being excreted by geese. It's a lot of, a lot of excrement on the fields. So the biologists here in Connecticut, they um, have studied the population. They collar them, and they tag their feet. And they've looked at the two different populations, the migratory one versus, well, there's actually three populations, but the two major ones, the, the resident ones, they want to separate, differentiate the resident ones from the migratory ones. Well, then um, our biologists have um, elongated the hunting seasons for the resident goose populations so that they reduce the populations using uh, hunting as a, you know seasons and bag limits. That's one method. The other method that they use is um, they allow towns to oil the eggs of the local geese. They get the local, um, uh, you know, wh whoever wants to control geese using egg oiling, they'll they'll get a permit from the DEP, which it also U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, has um, permitting process. And then they oil their eggs so that they reduce the population using the oil egg oiling technique. And each, um, and that then reduces the populations that are locally happening. The challenges with that system is that the geese end up, um, they, they may not, uh, they may nest off site in the following years and they end up still coming to the sites. So there's, there's a big challenge. But the challenges with the goose populations are that the resident geese have it really well. They're, they have plenty of food, they have shelter, they have cover, they have plenty of uh, you know, waterways and then all these beautiful green grass, grassy areas and they um, proliferate at a much greater rate than the migration, the migratory population. So that, it's one of the challenges that we have here in Connecticut is to balance the populations with these local challenges with getting these fields all filled up with this um, uh, excrement and uh, you know, having ball fields not, not you know, be able to be playing on them by, for, by the residents. Okay, uh, wood ducks nest on the ground in swamps or in cavities? Okay, the answer is in cavities. A lot of, a lot of folks um, uh, that don't know anything about cavity nesting birds, when they know, when they realize that the, this duck nests in cavities, they're, they're pretty amazed. Um, it's one of the saving graces of the population of, of uh, wood ducks. Historically, if you go back to when Connecticut was mostly pasture field and all the forests were cut down for the family farms and all the beaver weren't building any more swamps because there were no trees around and there were beaver populations declined. Um, these wood duck boxes, which are six pieces of wood with a hole in it, um, restored the populations of wood ducks here in North America. And it's one of the success stories of wildlife conservation. And if you um, have a, a pond on your property or your town, if you get permission from your town to, or swamps in your, in your town, your schoolyard, um, it's always, uh, I always found it rewarding to, to place one of these boxes in the swamps and check them every year. And you can, uh, you, you, it's, it's pretty easy to be successful at uh, attracting wood ducks. They, uh, they will um, 
readily take to these kinds of boxes. Um, if you put them on a post in the water to get out there when there's ice and you punch a hole through the ice and put a, a you know a nice fence post in and then bolt another fence post on it and then bolt a, a nice wood duck box to the top of that. They're very successful when they're out in the water because not a lot of predators get in there. But just imagine um, these guys, the, the female right now, a lot of them already um, have checked out the nests already. Some have already started laying eggs here in Connecticut. Um, they're, 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 uh, you go to some of our swamps, you'll see these uh, very colorful, the, the male is really brilliantly colored and the females more camouflaged, but they will, uh, they will readily take to these uh, wood duck nest boxes. Okay, which of the following habitats is optimal for rough grouse? A lot of people um, don't know what a rough grouse is. A rough grouse is a, uh, it's a, considered a game bird, a huntable bird. Here in Connecticut, they've, they've um, steadily declined. And uh, the answers I, I give you here are, do they need a forest with predominantly saw timber sized forest? Do they need a forest with seedling sapling conditions? Or do they need a grassland of greater than 20 acres? So what do you guys think? Um, the fact that they've declined in Connecticut and you know a little bit about the history of the land might give you a, a quick, you might be able to answer this a little quicker if you know a little bit more about the conditions of our forest. As our forests are getting older, um, the rough grouse is not finding as much habitat. And they need forest that has seedling sapling, predominantly seedling sapling forest. They're a disturbance habitat species. In other words, they thrive on disturbance habitat. They love beaver swamps that are, that it, you know, trees have been cut down and then abandoned, dense thicket areas, edges of woods, forestry projects that, that uh, cut, um, you know, patch cuts and they create um, shelter wood cuts with, you know, significant density, understory density. Um, I videotaped a, um, one at Sessions Woods one day. I was cutting out um, winged euonymus in the understory and along this, it's actually pole timber, but there's some seedling for, you know, it's, it's getting a little bit older, but it was a, while we were cutting, I, li I was listening and I hear, I'm hearing there's something walking towards us. So I stopped and, you know, there's two of us there, we're looking and I, I can't make out what it is. I figured it was maybe a turkey or a deer coming in. And so I videotaped what was coming in. And uh, now bear with me, these guys are very tough to videotape. So I'm gonna show you, there's a grouse in here. I promise you, you're gonna see it. At, you're gonna see it, I'll stop the video for you. But I'll, I'll let you have a glimpse of how uh, um, tough to find these guys are, how tough to see them, you know, uh, while they're walking through the woods or, and even if they're there, usually they spook the heck out of you. They flush right, right in front of you. you don't, you never really get a chance to see them on the ground. Well, um, I, I'm sneaking up on this one. I don't know how, I, I was really being careful. I don't have the sound on, but um, you're gonna catch like a three second glimpse of this rough grouse. I'm gonna um, stop the video when I, when I actually see it. Now, look right here at the bottom right hand corner of this, of this um, box of the screen. Just keep pay attention. See something moving there? Look right there. Okay, here's the head. Here's the tuft. Here's the head. Here's the body. They are so camouflaged. I mean, here's the eyeball right here. The eyeball. So if you see up here at this photo, see this tuft? Now you could you could just barely I, I'm I, if you if you turn away for a second, you you won't see it. Now watch. All right, see it? See it right here? Okay. Here's the head. Here's the tuft. Here's the body. Here's the rough. This is the little black spot right there is the, the rough. They call the rough, the ruffle of the grouse. And um, it's one of the rare videos that I've ever been able to take of a grouse. It's very challenging, but I'm sharing it with you. And now I'm videotaping and I'm having a hard time finding it. You can see it was on the very edge of the video, you know. Anyway, um, thought I'd share that with you. And I snuck up to it and it took off and went, you know, made this loud noise with its wings. And basically they spooked the heck out of you when they flush away. Okay, true or false? 
the white star on the head of this rabbit cottontail indicates that it's an eastern cottontail. True or false? What do you guys think? Connecticut has two cottontails. The native one is the New England. The eastern is the introduced. So true. This little white star right here is the only external characteristic that if you get to see that, you could say, well, that's an eastern cottontail. Other than that, good luck. They're not easy to tell apart. Uh, that is one that you could count on. So if you, if you see a rabbit, you can see its star on its head. It's an eastern cottontail. If you can't see a star on its head, doesn't mean it's a New, it's a New England because there's many Easterns that don't have stars on their head. So it's very challenging. Um, road kills, we take them back to the lab. We, we could take the skin off the skull and there's actually these sutures, jagged versus smooth, and you're able to tell what they are. And also genetically, we, we send out samples of their droppings and our biologists determine it through even just their droppings. I have a video to share with you. Um, this guy, I couldn't tell if it was an Eastern or a New, or New England. At, at times I look and I think I see a white star on its forehead. And then I look a little carefully and I think it's a black dot. And, but anyway, what's really cool about this slide that I like is the, the voracious feeding that these things do in the summer. They just truly devour vegetation. Now this is common plantain. And, um, and uh, this, this rabbit was uh, just going crazy eating the common plantain. I, I just discovered this plantain as an herbal thing this past summer. I actually started making tea out of it and it's actually really good for you. But the rabbit here was selecting for it dramatically. You know, a couple more little facts about cottontails, you know, here, I can't tell if this is an Eastern or, a, or New England, but um, they uh, are really uh, interesting because they practice corprophagia. Corprophagia, what is that? Corprophagia is they don't, um, they, they recycle their droppings. Now I'm a biologist, so I, I'm okay with talking about this. You know, scatology, um, a rabbit will recycle their, their dropping at least one time. So it goes through, you know, the first dropping goes out soft, they'll re-ingest it to then get more nutrients out of it. I know it sounds gross as humans, but, but it's called corprophagia. And uh, pra uh, cottontails practice that. And it, what it is, is it allows them to, re to further digest their dropping to get more nutrition out of it, corprophagia. Of course, this would be the summer range. Now they're eating herbaceous stuff. Once the winter comes, they go into the woody vegetation and they'll eat uh, you know, blackberry uh, canes, they'll eat black raspberry canes, they'll eat small saplings, they're eating woody vegetation and the bark of vegetation is their winter food. Their summer food, they love to eat herbaceous things like this common plantain. Now, another little quiz, what direction are these rabbit tracks uh, going? Are they going north or are they going south? Now, if you were um, in, the, you know, in the woods when there was a little bit of snow on and you were tracking an animal and you came upon these tracks, if you were starving and you were out hunting for rabbits, well, what direction those tracks are going is very important, right? Well, these tracks are going north. They're going to the top of the screen. How do I know that? They're going in they're going in this direction, north. Now, what they do is when they hop, these two front feet land first. And then their rear feet come in front and they jump with their rear feet. Okay. They, they jump with their rear feet and they land in their front feet. Then they jump with their rear feet. Now, why do they do that? Well, they put their feet because they're usually negotiating vegetation, right? They're jumping through dense vegetation. So their feet are one in front of the other. And then they, so they're very good at negotiating vegetation, navigating through dense vegetation because if they're being chased by a hawk or, or a fox or anything. So um, now if that was a squirrel track, it would be more like a U. See how it looks like a Y? See how this, see how this um, 
looks like a Y. Now, if this was a, a squirrel instead of a rabbit, this front paw would be over here because squirrels climb trees and they, they don't have any reason to cross their front feet. They're solid and they go up trees. They don't have to negotiate vegetation. So a little bit about the, the anatomy of an animal is connected to its behavior, right? And survival, okay? So the rabbit's heading north in this, in this case. <clears throat> now, true or false? White-tailed deer are ruminants. Are they, are they like cows or are they like horses? Horses are not ruminants. Are they more like a, a cow or are they more like a horse? Well, they are ruminants. It's true. They, they, uh, they eat their food very rapidly. Within an hour and a half, they try to get most of the food. Why? They don't want to get exposed to a predator. They don't want to eat by attacked by a mountain lion or a wolf or some predatory animal. They've evolved eating real quickly. And then they go find a hiding place where they could see, hear, or smell predators coming in. Now, here, here's an example. Um, hopefully it'll... Um, here is a, a deer, it's bedded, you know, it's bedded down, usually fit, picks an area where the wind is in its favor, and it can see or hear or smell predators. You see it's chewing. What it does is, because it's got multi-stomachs, multi it has, you know, multi-chambered stomach, it regurgitates its food and then finishes digesting it, chewing it, and then swallowing it. What, what advantage does that have? Well, it ate rapidly. Now it's in one place and it can do, it can finalize its chewing and its uh, feeding and not be exposed to predation. Okay, it's an evolutionary advantage to be a ruminant. Okay, it's one of the advantages being a ruminant. Plus, um, they can really digest their food very well. Now, true or false? Bobcats weigh up to sixty pounds. I always, um, I'm always amazed that you know people see something and they'll say, you know, I saw, you know this amount of pound animal. And, and then when you actually look at the animal, it, it's, it always appears bigger in the woods and in the fields. What do you think? It's false. The biggest one that I know uh, that the last time I talked with Paul Rigo for bear biologist was a 39 pound male. I'm, he, they may have gotten one different than that, but that was the last time I talked to him. It was killed as it was a roadkill in uh, Farmington. And, um, you know, they're, they're really not that big. The, uh, the, the female can be 15 to 30 pounds and the male 18 to 35 pounds. You know, it's not a small, not small, but it's not, not 60 pounds. But when you see them in the wild, sometimes they look a lot bigger. <clears throat> this slide that you see right here, this bobcat is at Sessions Woods. I was driving my vehicle in the morning. I was heading into work. It was about 7.30 in the morning. 20 of eight, something like that. And I was going by and I see a police, you know, light of a police car. And I saw a, a, a pickup, uh, yeah, you know, uh, one of those uh, car uh, carriers, you know, uh, taking a car, loading up a car. And I said to, I lowered my window. I said, hey, what's going on? Uh, they said, oh, uh, there's a, a deer, this car hit a deer and there's, you know, and I go, where's the deer? And they said, well, it's, it's over there in the woods. And there's a bobcat um, next to it. And I'm like, really? And I, so I got out, I parked my truck safely and I went over and I took this photo. And uh, you could see the, um, it's looking right at me and it's got the deer fur right here. This bobcat consumed that, that um, it was actually a, a buck without antlers. It was in January and it actually ate that deer. Now, we don't know if it was chasing that deer onto the road or if it found it afterwards. But within literally 20 minutes of the deer getting hit by the car, the bobcat was on it and eating it. And uh, we have many, many photos of this, uh, this particular bobcat here at Sessions Woods. Deer make up a very small part of their food habits, uh, but they will take advantage of, of a roadkill like that. Which of the following birds is, is an invasive and competes for cavities with the Eastern bluebirds? <clears throat> 
So if you look at the answers, the possible answers, you'd want to first know if the animal, if the animals are cavity nester. Of all those listed there, only one is a cavity nester, the house sparrow. So you can narrow it down. So the answer is house sparrow. And um, uh, I know I shared with you this with you on the limiting factors talk that I gave, but I, I always want to reemphasize the the this uh, bird is very detrimental to our native cavity nesting populations. And, um, you know, I always uh, uh, try to get people to understand that when they do put out cavity cavities for birds, nesting box, next nesting boxes up there, so they have to be responsible that the house sparrow doesn't take over those boxes. And not only do they take them over, but you don't want them, um, you know, here's one, you can see the house sparrow is uh, ousting the house wren uh, and it's basically out competing it. Um, but there's also cases where they um, they actually kill the animal, and um, and that's what you evidence here. You, you know they'll they'll actually kill the um, the bird on the nest, and it's uh, important to monitor your boxes when you put them out there so that you don't allow the house sparrow the advantage of taking over those boxes. If you're not willing to 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 manage house sparrows and get you know so that you dissuade them from getting in these boxes, you're really um, just, you know, causing damage to the native bird population. Um, I just want you to know that uh, the house sparrow is not um, protected by law, so you can take their eggs in their nest out. I don't, not everybody feels comfortable doing that, but I just want you to know that um, uh, it is allowed uh, once you can recognize the house sparrow eggs. Um, versus the other eggs and uh, and try to dissuade them. The, the, this um, slide here shows the house sparrow nest is not very neat. It's got a lot of, you find a lot of wrappers in there and a lot of straw that's discombobulated string and a lot, they'll bring in a lot of stuff into the box and their, their eggs are speckled. You see them down here. If you do um, decide to manage your boxes against the house sparrow. Be sure that you, um, you know, that you know how to differentiate all the, all the other birds there. They, any bird other than the house sparrows and starlings are protected by law. So, you know, you need to know that. Okay, true or false, this is a morning dove. Now, I unfortunately had another picture there for you, so you had a comparison. But it always strikes me uh, when I see a morning, a, a, uh, this photo of this passenger pigeon. Um, uh, it looks very much like a morning dove, and, I, uh, and, I, and I've always, uh, when I, you know, I, I was fortunate to work at the Museum of Natural History at UConn for during my undergrad years at uh, UConn, and I, um, was able to, um, you know, I took a photo of this in the museum uh, collection. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's just an awe to look at it because you it makes you realize how beautiful it was. But it was strike when I first saw it, it was so strikingly similar to the morning dove. When I look at it, I, I do a double take. But look at the eye. See the orange eye here, the reddish orange eye versus the dark eye, right? And, um, the morning dove is very solitary. They pair up and they'll have one nest in a tree versus the passenger pigeon was very colonial. They had many, many, many nests in a tree. You know, they were very colonial. So they, they, they congregated in large numbers. Uh, very different, um, you know, um, breeding habitat, breeding, um, you know, um, mechanism there. Um, but um, strikingly similar. And uh, I, I always get a, a now, Martha, the pigeon in the Cincinnati Zoo, that was the last known living passenger pigeon. It was like 1913, I believe, in the Cincinnati Zoo died. Now, I recently read that there is actually talk by zoologists and uh, people are interested in bringing back extinct species. And I, I was amazed to read that they're thinking about it. And uh, that's something to contemplate uh, in the future, is that going to happen? Are we going to be able to bring back an extinct species? It was unthinkable, you know, in the past. Now it's actually uh, being actually considered. It's going to be a, a, a big question for 
uh, evolutionary biologists to answer, do they, do we want to do that? And you young, you young uh, uh, folks out there, you're going to be grappling with that in the future, I think, uh, to think about, do we allow the, re, you know, the, to bring back an extinct species if we're able to? And um, that's going to be a big question. So with the uh, Ch Chinese, with the uh, American chestnut, we're definitely, looks like they're going to go forward with splicing a gene that will uh, produce an enzyme to kill off the blight on the American chestnut. So that's going to, that looks like that's going forward. This one here is going to be interesting, whether we, whether evolutionary biologists and our scientists of the world that have to make a decision and if they would ever bring back uh, an extinct species. But the point I want to make with this slide too is that extinction is forever and the habitat, the denuding of the habitat from the East Coast all the way to Mississippi down to Florida and North to Maine, we denuded and created all that farmland. And then the passenger, and we had no regulated take. In other words, they were taking the eggs, they were taking the adults without any seasons or bag limits. There were no such thing back then. They, they pretty much marketed everything. They, they would take the eggs, the squabs, the babies, the adults, they would just use them for food. Not, not ever thinking of a season or a bag limit. Uh, that's different than regulated hunting today, which we, there's a season of bag limit. Um, but the extinction of the passenger pigeon was really uh, staying out of our past. How, you know, unfortunately we weren't thinking conservation wise back then. We just kind of, you know, people um, utilize the resource without thinking of seasons, bag limits, regulations, you know, take a much, you know, uh, you know, reasonable harvest rather than uh, this, you know, un unlimited, unregulated take. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, it's just a, an interesting uh, animal. I always get a, a really neat when I, when I see this animal. It intrigues me, the, uh, the resemblance to the morning dove. How many estimated eagles are nesting annually in Connecticut now? 20, 40, or 70? Um, we're very fortunate that it's 70. Last year, that was the estimated population of nesting birds. Um, amazing comeback. Uh, one of my favorite uh, birds of, uh, of our, uh, you know, here in Connecticut. When I was a young boy, I never saw one. Um, once I saw one on the Connecticut River in the winter, thought it was amazing back when I was a young, you know, young kid. And uh, now I see them in my neighborhood and I see, you know, uh, here, here in, in where I live and uh, all around the state, you know, as you're driving. Yesterday I saw one, you know, Route 44 flying over the Route 44, just, um, you know, beautiful. And uh, and I see him here, I see him in Wallingford, I see him in Cheshire right nearby. Phenomenal, canoeing the Quinnipiac River, I see him flying around. And it's all because people cared and they stopped the DDT spraying and they, and, and biologists and conservationists and brought, brought this bird back. Uh, true or false, gray fox are known to climb uh, in trees. True or false? One of the cool facts is it's true. Um, gray foxes are really interesting creatures. They, uh, in my lifetime, you know, I've seen them maybe half a dozen, a dozen times, maybe half a dozen times, maybe you know, I can count on both hands the number of times I've actually seen them running around. I see their tracks, but um, what an animal. They're, they're really, uh, they love, um, you know, swampy areas, wood, you know, woodland edges. Um, but when they're chased by a predator, like a coyote or anything, they'll, they'll climb a tree versus the uh, red fox that doesn't have the, that capability. Bobcats can climb up, but uh, the, these guys are known to, to climb up a tree. So that, that's a neat strategy for the uh, gray fox. Um, true or false, possums are the only marsupial found in Connecticut. Okay, the answer is true. And you know why this animal evolved as a marsupial here in North America, here in Connecticut, and we don't have any other marsupials here in Connecticut? It's a big question mark evolutionarily. You know, why did this one animal, you know, go off into the being a marsupial when everything else 
did it um, is really interesting. You know, the land down under has many marsupials, right? And so it's very interesting um, how this, how the opossum, I always find the opossum interesting when I've ever, I've observed them that like, I, I see them a lot of times right at dusk, you'll see them come out, especially in the winter, like, you know, or in the spring uh, as well. Um, I was removing my wood pile last year and uh, we found a little den underneath the wood pile. Um, they brought a bunch of leaves and we overwintered there. But I, I um, they, they can also present a challenge if you're a gardener, like my father-in-law had a nice grape arbor with conquered grapes and these guys would wrap their tail and they hang down and just and actually spit out the seed, spit out the, the shell of the conquered grape, just like we do. Um, and it was pretty, it was comical at first, but when we lost most of them, my, my father-in-law was a little, had a little bit of steam coming out of his ears. But uh, uh, they're uh, interesting characters. They, they're, they're readily eaten by, um, you know, great horned owls and, you know, night, night predators because they're nocturnal. They're out at night. Uh, but real interesting animal. And they'll carry their, you know, I've seen them waddling through the woods with a bunch of young on their, hanging on their backs too. They're really, really cool animals. And, uh, um, and then with, you know, the playing possum thing has always been fascinating to me where they, you know, they get spooked and they'll fall over, make believe they're, they're, they're dead and you walk off and they take off. Um, really cool animal. True or false, snowshoe hares are found in Connecticut. True or false, snowshoe hares. Okay, the answer is true. We're at about the southern range of the snowshoe hare population, but I want to share with you an interesting fact. The, young, the white coloration, say it didn't snow one year. Say we had a year, no snow. Does the snowshoe hare say, hey, you know, I'm going to stay brown this year. I don't want to get, I don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. Well, no. The photo period, the time of the day, the length of the sunlight, the photo period, the daylight photo period, meaning the daylight length, will, will trigger the, the pelage to turn white and then reverse. So as the daylight gets shorter, as we get closer to the fall, their, their pelt turns white. As the daylight gets longer in the now, you know, late in the winter and into spring, it turns brown. So um, if you took that animal, put it in the laboratory and messed up the lighting and made it longer and shorter, however you want to do it, you can cause them to turn white um, in, in other times of the year. So it's the photo period that determines the change in the pelt. In, in nature, this photo period is very important. It triggers a lot of things, even uh, for deer, um, their grow, anther growth. Um, as soon as the daylight gets longer, um, the antlers start growing on the deer. As the daylight gets shorter at the end of the summer, the, the, the velvet sloughs off and the antlers harden up. And then they, um, so the, that, that also goes with the photo period, the antler growth. And so um, there's a lot of neat things that happen with the photo period uh, in, in, in animal populations. True or false, Eastern box turtles are listed as species of special concern. Okay, the answer is true. I just want to review what species of special concern mean because a lot of people um, they they think they're in that the, the eastern box turtle is endangered. Well, no, it's not endangered. Uh, endangered. Th there's a specific criteria for animals to be listed. Special concern is given to animals that even though there's enough breeding population out there, there's a concern for the future of that animal. For the example, this the, for the eastern box turtle, there's plenty of individuals out there. The problem is where there's not a lot of recruitment of young. In other words, the young are not getting recruited, so the future population is is in danger. You know, is, is could go down dramatically. So special concern, we we usually put special concern status on animals that, although they're still around and they're, you know, you can find them readily. You know, they have something in their environment that causes them to be have a concern for their future so right now you know they're okay they're 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 around but in the future you know they're getting hit by cars they're not recruiting their young 
um, there's a concern for the future. So if we give them this kind of uh, status, then we have opportunities to do something about it before they become threatened or endangered, okay? Um, so you could look up threatened and endangered. There's actually a criteria for how many of the individuals are breeding and you could come up, you know, there's a list of, you know, threatened, endangered and um, rare. And you could, you know, you could, I'll, I'll let you look that up in, the, in, our, um, in our fact sheets, you know, uh, online. But, um, but the special concern status is given for that so that we can do something now that can prevent it from a future um, becoming threatened or endangered, okay? Uh, true or false, raccoons are a rabies vector species. True or false, raccoons are a rabies vector species. Uh, the answer is true. In uh, 1991, I was catching raccoons from in the 80s uh, as part of my work when I was at the experiment station and they asked us, you know, we asked if we needed a rabies vaccination. And at the time in the eighties, we didn't need one. The, uh, the word raccoon rabies was not in the state. 1991 was the first recorded raccoon rabies case. And, and it was down in Ridgefield and they don't know how maybe this raccoon got, was in a garbage truck, you know, when, when they threw the garbage in a garbage truck and it ended up in Connecticut. We don't know how it got here, but the disease finally got here. It was down in the South. And what does that mean? Well, change the status of the raccoon. Raccoons couldn't be rehabilitated by rehabbers anymore unless you had a special license for it. In other words, you had to be vaccinated and you had to have a special uh, training for it. And then uh, they, we never, we wouldn't allow them to be re relocated anymore. So say there was one in your attic or in your chimney and uh, you live trapped it. We wouldn't allow it to be released off site anymore because rabies vector species, we didn't want that rabies being spread around. Now, the rabies, the raccoon rabies is found in the rabies, in the raccoon population. So that therefore these different rules started to apply to the raccoon population. Um, just because it's a rabies vector species doesn't mean that all the raccoons have rabies, no, but it's in, it's in their uh, breed, it's in their population. So um, uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, you always want your cats and dogs vaccinated because uh, you don't want them going outside and fighting with a raccoon that is rabid. Um, you're never, you're most likely not going to get rabies from a raccoon. You end up getting it from a rabid dog or a cat that's been exposed to a rabid raccoon if it ever does happen. So it, we always caution people to make sure that their pets are vaccinated. That's probably the number one thing is make sure your pet, pets are vaccinated for, from rabies. For, you know, for rabies, raccoon, rabies. The other ra rabies vector species is uh, skunk. We don't allow the relocation or transfer of skunk or, or um, raccoons anymore because of that, of the rabies uh, challenge. Uh, true or false, mute swans are an invasive species. True or false? True. This one is a tough one. Um, um, a, if you look right here, well, let me, let me explain. These were, mute swans are European species. They were brought into Connecticut because people love to see them swimming around in their ponds. So they'll buy a pair, they'll put them in their ponds and they're usually pinioned. They pinion their feathers so they can't fly off and they'll, they'll um, reproduce and have young. And um, the, um, it's the largest bird in North America. And see this little bone right here, it's called an allula. And, it, and that bone, they use it to, to protect themselves and defend territory and they'll hit other birds with it. And they actually have been known to break somebody's arm. The, a researcher broke his arm once for getting hit by that, that allula. Um, so that you don't take it lightly. You don't want to mess with a mute swan that's got a nest in a territory. Um, they're highly prolific. They live about 30 years and they can produce a lot of young. So they're not, they're very uh, prolific breeder. Um, if, you, if you don't believe how aggressive they are, you find one of their nests and you try to kayak or canoe by their nest and you'll see them come out and they'll defend their territory. I've seen them. I've been in a canoe and they've come at the canoe 
And anyway, um, Rhode Island has been oiling their eggs uh, with a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service permitting, or you know, with their with, uh, with well their own permits over there because they're not protected by law in in Rhode Island, and they oil them and they're reducing their population by using oil, egg oiling. Connecticut has a law that prohibits the harming of swans. So the swans are protected by law, even though they're invasive species. You know, biologists know they're invasive. They're technically protected by law. So we've never practiced in Connecticut oil, egg oiling or any population management strategies. Um, you can see them here. This one's chasing these geese off the pond, but they'll do that with other, other waterfowl as well, not just geese. Their long necks feed down into the water. So they're disproportionately eating the aquatic vegetation, just you know, reducing the habitat quality for other waterfowl. So that's the challenge is that they're, they're competing for resources. And um, these backyard birds end up flying off the, the mom and pop kick them out after a year. So they got to find their own area. And that's where the, the feral population get started it's from these these backyard birds okay it's a challenge it, this is a wildlife habitat this is a wildlife um, invasive species uh, challenge that biologists have very difficult because people love to look at them you know swans are beautiful it's undeniably beautiful white bird uh, the, the big the challenge is ecological how do we look at it ecologically and how do we manage them from on an ecological side that this is a, a pretty big challenge for wildlife managers <clears throat> true or false eastern coyotes are not native to connecticut true or false this one um surprises a lot of people when you see the answer yeah they're not native um they were not here historically when the native Indigenous people were here in Connecticut before pre-colonial settlement, there were no Eastern coyotes here. Uh, we think the theory is that they either came from Canada or we don't know how they came across. They were on the other side of the Mississippi. And we know that genetically they have more, um, they have some wolf gene in them. So they're an interesting animal. They're about five or 10 pounds bigger than their East, their Western cousins. And um, so it's an interesting animal that has moved into Connecticut in the in the whole northeast uh and chris van gave a talk last um last month about it um very challenging but it's an animal that has adapted to urban suburban environments they they're they're really a newcomer to connecticut in the 50s is when they started we started seeing them here in connecticut when connecticut biologists started documenting their presence in the 50s Okay, question 18, true or false? This is a cat track. False, uh, why is it false? Well, um, when cats walk, they don't, they retract their claws. And so a cat track would look like this. There are no claws showing. So um, if you see here, there's no claws. Whereas in this track, you see the claws showing. There's only one cat track in the world that would show claws when, when, it, when, it, when it's walking, and that would be a cheetah. All the other cats retract their claws entirely. So um, if you're snow tracking or looking in mud and you see claws in the track, it's not gonna be a cat. It'll, it'll most likely in the dog family, fox, coyote, um, uh, wolf. Um, anyway, so um, that um, uh, animal tracking is, can be a lot of fun. Um, in this case, uh, a lot of people confuse um, cat tracks um, when they see a, a large track in the snow. It's got the claws in it. They think it's a large cat, um, when in fact, uh, there shouldn't be any claws if it's a cat track, okay? And question 19, true or false, timber rattlesnakes are protected by law in Connecticut. It's true. Um, these are the areas that um, rattlesnakes used to be found in Connecticut. And these are, this is the, the current range. 
uh, you can see it's very diminished. Um, and uh, they are protected by law here in Connecticut. Okay, true or false? Only male wild turkeys have beards. True or false? False. And here's a video to prove it. Ready? Here is a hen. I pulled over to the side of the road and I'm, and I'm videotaping it. Now, that is a hen, okay? Um, the, the beard is not quite as uh, dense as the male turkey beard, but you'll see it's, it's hanging there. Um, some people say, well, that looks like a jake because there's a spur. Well, there's no spurs here. If you look at the feet right here, this is part of the, it's part of the foot. There's no spur here, okay? There's a spur here, that would be a tom. Jakes don't have spurs, but they're very small knobs. But this, this is a this is definitely a hen turkey. It's got the pink head, pinkish with the gray, light brown, and there's the beard. Now, when a, a turkey biologist once told me, Pete, 10% of hens have beards, I said, I don't believe it. You know, I didn't believe him. I'm like, no way. You know, I don't believe it. 10 out of 100 have beards. I'm like, the more I walk around, the more I, they, they're 10%, definitely. Um, I've, I, I couldn't turn up my picture of the, I had a slide with five hen turkeys with beards. I have, I have shared to you in the future. I couldn't find it today. But anyway, they do. The, the beard is a, a vestigial thing. Uh, they, they're not, it's, it's not a hair. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a modified feather. It, it continues to grow throughout the life of the, Turkey. So all the other feathers get molted. In other words, they, you know, they'll, they'll replace the other feathers, but they do not replace the beard feathers. They continue to grow throughout the year, the life of, of the turkey. So the longer that beard, the older that turkey is. And um, a lot of times the ice and the snow will, you know, uh, abrade, you know, uh, cause it to, to shorten them, you know, because they, it's abrasive, um, but they, they um, grow throughout the life of the turkey. And um, I have a really neat video that I'd like to share. This turkey was in a field here and it was um, preening, you know, it's preening itself. And, you know, turkeys don't have the luxury of taking a jacket off and putting a new one on. They have to take care of their feathers. All birds um, have to take care of their feathers. And this one's preening and taking care of its feathers. And it, so sometimes they dust themselves in the dust in the, you know, to, to further condition. But this, this behavior that it's going to do right now is what I really want you to see. Watch. It's going to take its bill and it's going to go pick up oil. It's going to pick up, there's two glands here. It picks up the oil. Now watch what it's going to do. The oil's in its bill. And it's going to go over, watch, to its beard. And it's going to put the oil on its beard. Watch. There it goes. It's conditioning that beard. You know, it's a secondary sex characteristic. In this case, they do, um, you know, it's part of their... Uh, courtship behavior, the, the fanning of the tail, the, the, the beard, and the um, coloration, the redhead, um, the, the snood. There's all these neat things that the male turkey does to attract the female to, to, uh, for, for uh, mating. And, but um, this, I always uh, enjoy watching this uh, video because it, um, it shows how much they care about their their coat. Now look back here. Look right back here in this video. You're going to see a female. Watch. There's going to be a, a hen back here. And she's going to be doing the same thing. She's preening. Watch. In a couple seconds, you'll see the hen. There's the behavior again. Getting the oil gland. The oil. But watch back here. I want you to take your eye off the turkey and look back here now. Look right back here. Watch back here. Come on. I'll, uh, look back here, right here. Come on. Where is it? I know it's back. I know she's back there. You'll see her. Right there. Look, look, there's the hen. See the hen? She's going to the oil gland right there. Did you guys see that? I noticed that many, many months after I took this video that she was back there doing that. And she's also preening and look, getting the oil gland. Anyway, um, I hope you, um, this is my last question. And uh, we're going to, um, 
be able to open up for questions and answers. Um, I have a, a lot of other little videos down here that has filler in case you guys want any more cool stuff to look at for videos. But let's open it up for questions from from the uh, students and advisors, uh, so you guys can enjoy. You know, thank you for your thank you for paying attention and participating. <laughs>